I was looking into the increased criminalization of climate protest. Australia and the UK and Europe and Africa and Latin America and India and all these different places. And we were seeing a lot of the same rhetoric showing up in media. So it was like, okay, there seems to be a pattern here where like a conservative pundit goes on to radio and TV and whatever and talks about climate activists in like one of two ways. They're either like young kids that don't know what they're saying and should be in school so they can learn about economics or eco terrorists. And like, this is a slippery slope to anarchy. And these people are really scary. And I'm like, what is that? What's like linking them? Cause there were definitely some things in common with, you know, all the coal countries shared some approaches. So there's definitely some industry, you know, collaboration and coordination going on there. But then I started to look at who is this spokesperson affiliated with? And in every single case, it was a think tank in that country. It was like, okay, so there's all these think tanks. Do they have a relationship? And then sure enough, it was like, oh, they're all part of the Atlas Network. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is the extraordinary Amy Westervelt. Amy is an independent investigative climate journalist who's been on the climate beat for more than 20 years, reporting for just about everyone under the sun and also co-creating the incredible true crime podcast Drilled which investigated how big oil scammed the world. Amy is just one of the most phenomenal climate journalists out there, and I've been following her work for a very long time. She is so knowledgeable, transparent, justice-oriented, and prolific. She joined me today to discuss one of her latest investigations into the Atlas Network, the shadowy network of lobbyists and think tanks that are creating climate policies today that villainize activists and delay action. The story is like something out of a Bond movie. It begins with Anthony Fisher in World War II, where his brother was killed by the Nazis in front of him. Amy explains how this man's fear of socialism led to him helping drive the move towards neoliberalism in the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, Australia, even Latin America. This is the story of the they, the them, the puppet masters, if you will, the people with their hands on the levers, even if some of them, as she explains, don't even realize what they're doing. Amy reveals the impact that the Atlas Network has had on climate policy around the world, including the recent increased criminalization of climate activists. Naturally, of course, the Atlas Network has links to the fossil fuel industry, with Amy revealing that the fossil fuel industry has funded a huge amount of public policy schools and economic theory over the past 100 years, commissioning economic models that support extractivism, expansionism and growth. This is a fascinating conversation about empire, capitalism, corruption, cronyism, corporate capture and sovereignty, and why a revolution may, quite frankly, be inevitable. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Amy, thank you so much for joining me on Planet Critical. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. (laughs) <laughs> I've been following your work, obviously, for years, and I love that it's like at the heart of climate journalism. It's really dominated by women. And your work uh, uh, has just been amazing and really, really inspiring all this time. Thank so you. thank you. <laughs> 
So my first question for you is, why is the world in crisis? I think there are a lot of reasons the world is in crisis. But for me, the thing that I've been obsessing about for the last like 10 years is the extent to which extractivism and sort of hyper individualism and competition gets rewarded and sort of incentivized in most global north countries. Um, I think the US is by far the worst actor on on this stuff. Um, And you see it like, you really see it in not even just, you know, really obvious ways, like the way that corporations are more protected than people in the U S but also Mm -hmm. at the interpersonal level, like even within climate spaces, people are like competing for scraps so often that like there's, Mm -hmm. they really struggle with collaboration. People are very extractive in their interpersonal um, relationships. And that to me, I'm like, how are we going to figure out, how to build a system and a world that does not center extractivism when the people that are fighting for that are being extractive with each other. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. Like, I don't know how that's going to work. Um, so yeah, to me, it's sort of like, like when I think about the fossil fuel industry and the climate crisis, I think of it as a, as a crisis of, of extraction and a, an extractive kind of approach to the world in general and mm-hmm. I think that there's kind of like, that's the thing that needs to be addressed at almost every layer of, of society. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think this like component of extraction of people as well is really, really important. Yeah. Because I mean, it can be branded as like exploitation, which mm-hmm. of course it is. But the fact that exploitation is you're literally taking, whether it's taking somebody else's labor, yep. somebody else's value, somebody else's time mm-hmm. in the same way that we do, you know, the earth's physical resources. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's ultimately it's like, you know, it's a... It's like a weird power play domination kind of move, you know, in the same way that like certain people will look at nature or the environment as like a thing that's ours to sort of pillage for, for individual benefit. People look at other people that way (laughs) too, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So yeah, I really, to me, I'm just like, Oh, you know, it's not just the energy source. Uh, it's it's the power structure, but it's also like what is at this like what we're placing as the sort of central value in a lot of different societies. You know, what's the decision making framework? How are we deciding what's important? Mm-hmm. And right now, it's completely skewed towards the individual benefit of a very small set of individuals. Um, yeah, because. Because this is the thing, right? This is where it gets kind of interesting because, yes, it's skewed towards a set of individuals, Mm -hmm. but they are particularly good at collaborating. Yes, they're very good at it. (laughs) They're better than anybody else is, actually. (laughs) Wild. They're really good. And they're really good at, like, bringing all of their issues under one tent. I was just talking about this the other day. I was like, you know who's really good at intersectionality? Conservatives. (laughs) Conservatives are great at it. Like... They're like, yeah, we can bring anti-trans, anti-climate, you know, mm-hmm. um, anti-tax all under the same tent and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no problem whatsoever. You know, um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm like, it's wild. They're actually better at it than the people that they sort of mock for for thinking that intersectionality is a, is a thing that we should be working towards. Um, and the, I mean, this is like, on, in the climate space in particular, I'm just like, you know, if you don't care about racial justice, gender justice, all of these other forms of social justice um, for, you know, all of the sort of obvious moral and ethical reasons, you should care that a lack of those things is a weakness that will be exploited and has been very effectively by your opponents, like over and over and over again. The reason that the right can so effectively accuse climate people of being elitist or being racist is because they have been. Like, yeah. you know, if the climate movement was really good at addressing race and class issues, then those those accusations would fall flat. I feel like we just saw this actually in the U.S. with the 
the auto workers strike for the first time in decades climate mm-hmm. people did a really good job of showing up for labor and because of that when right wing politicians were like oh all the problems that the auto workers are having are actually just being caused by climate policy it didn't work it didn't land it didn't work the auto workers themselves like rebuffed it immediately and i'm like this this is what you achieve when you <laughs> when you actually mm-hmm. show up for other people that are actually working on many of the same things as you. It might be kind of, you know, packaged differently, but it's, it's sort of a similar fight. Um, So yeah, I don't know. I like, I still talk to people in the climate space that are like, Oh, if you muddy the waters with all these other issues, then it's going to take us too long to address climate. And I'm just like, I just find that to be really backwards. Like I think really if you try to separate climate out from all these other issues, you're never going to actually solve it. Uh, Absolutely. Separating climate out is the way that you get to like a green techno utopian kind of madness that will never materialize. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, people that are like, no, 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 we just need to focus on renewable energy. And I'm like, okay, but then (laughs) what are you going to do about labor? What are you going to do about people? Like, I'm already seeing, I'm seeing so many people in the climate space being so dismissive of the idea that people in rural areas might not be that into the idea of a a giant industrial wind farm down the road. And like immediately it's like, Oh, those people are being, you know, paid for by the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. Some of them, some of them probably are, but also like it's, you know, pretty easy to understand why someone who's chosen to live in a rural area would not be super into the idea of industrial power plant down the road from them. And like, yeah, just refusing to engage with that at all is not going to make it go away. I'm like, this is, why is this always your approach to just like pretend the problem doesn't exist? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Nope. We're not going to engage with that. Like, I, why? <laughs> I know. I know. Because speaking to people is hard. Yeah. Uh, this to me yeah. comes – this is what I've been thinking about a lot because in the course of doing this podcast, like it's, you know, sort of fundamentally altered my personality, yeah. not to be dramatic or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and I used to be a real like bull to a red flag on issues. And don't get me wrong, you know, when it comes to justice, I still will be. But increasingly I'm interested in like how do I speak to this person? Yeah. Especially somebody who's like close to being on my side. You know, my, my mm-hmm. friend Patty has this amazing expression, like the vanity of small differences. Yeah. Right. Because it's so affronting, like somebody that cares about the same thing, but thinks about it in slightly different way to That's you. Which true. Kind of you're you're, you're much more annoyed by that, right? Than someone who's yeah. like way across. Yeah. It's true. Totally. Yeah. Because that person you can brand as an idiot or as a fascist, like anywhere on that spectrum from idiot right. to fascist, you can brand them as that. But somebody who essentially like doesn't approve of your own tactics or whatever it's kind of like insulting yeah and but I think the thing is like it's it's so much more difficult to and it shouldn't be but for whatever reason it's so much more difficult to go out and to find common ground with people because also the way that we have been sort of like indoctrinated or educated to have conversations to have debate yeah rather than actually have dialogue it's to attack one another and see who's left standing yeah and so it's like going down the road and saying to somebody like, hey, you know, you don't want this thing that I really want us to have. Like, can we talk about it? Because maybe maybe part of you is right and maybe a part of me is right. And maybe like in a deliberative democratic process, we can find out a good compromise. Yeah. But or the fact that we like don't have an idea to- that we haven't thought of yet that like might come out well, of exactly, that conversation. Right? Or like but- I might I might really figure out what it is about your approach that that like I think is genuinely wrong, which like helps me make the argument in the future. Absolutely. Too, Absolutely. You know? Totally. Totally. Yeah. But I, I you know to me the first thing that came to mind when I was thinking about like rural people not wanting industrial power plants in their backyard was also the first thing that came to mind was like, yeah man, mining like the effect of mining totally. on the environment. Exactly. Like what would happen to their waterways? What would happen to their soil? Like yeah. there are perfectly good reasons that are go beyond like, you know, middle and upper class aesthetics yeah exactly um exactly yeah yeah um i know and that too it's like i think a lot of people in the environmental movement are so worried that the the sort of right-wing talking point of like 
electrification is just as bad as fossil fuels, which is not true. You know, even the worst practices across the board on mining for electrification will not have quite as big of an impact as fossil fuels. But like, that doesn't mean you shouldn't f- try to clean up the the supply chain there or reduce the amount of consumption. Yes. Like that's another thing that people are like, such a non-starter because they're like oh no we can't talk to americans about reducing consumption what like why Mm -hmm. we did it in the 70s it was fine you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) and and like this idea that i don't know i'm like we don't actually want to have to like have to build the largest possible renewable energy facilities all over the place it's actually a really big problem for land use and all these other reasons and like we should want to have to build fewer of them yeah that's better across the board you know but um but people are very weird about that conversation strange i think it's because that like infrastructure then starts to reflect what society could possibly look like Mm -hmm. and you know i'm smaller like and perhaps more and smaller, like decentralized power plants, yeah. in which may be community owned and people like, you know, yeah. own the means of production, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Like you're fundamentally attacking capitalism then. Yeah. Then in the heart of capitalism. Right. If you're and, saying maybe not the biggest and most expensive, people are like, oh, yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to make the most energy out of everyone. No, you don't. <laughs> no, we really don't. Because there's a bunch of research that shows there's really diminishing returns after basic needs are met on energy there's really like very little improvement to quality of life per excellent consumption yeah it's like it's actually like there's a bunch of peer-reviewed economic research on this that that decouples increased fossil fuel use from um, increased lifespan and also uh, increased quality of life over time. So like once, I mean, it's similar to all the studies on wealth, right? Like once you yeah. achieve a certain level where like you're not stressing out about um, shelter and food and, and you know, basic energy needs, then there are diminishing returns on on increased wealth. But again, like all of that flies in the face of, of capitalism, which tells you like more is always better. And, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I had an interesting conversation with Akshat Rothi recently from Bloomberg who wrote, he wrote a book called climate capitalism, which I'm like, the title of this book, uh, like kind of makes me cringe a little bit. I, I you know, uh-huh. I'm not going to lie. And, and he's like, no, no, I know. Like, I don't think that like, you know, capitalism is necessarily the best system either, but I'm worried that like we have a limited amount of time to address this problem. And like, probably we're not going to completely replace um, all the economic systems in the world in the next eight years. So like, how do we make, how do we make capitalism work better for us? Like, how do we, you know, how do we rein it in? And like, Oh yeah. How do we brain capitalism? No, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm like all of like, Everything you're suggesting sounds good, but it ignores the fact that like people like you are not in charge. So like, how do you force a bunch of companies Mm -hmm. that have been able to kind of do whatever they want and Mm -hmm. not have anything reined in for a long time? (laughs) You know, I'm like, I mean, I feel like there's no way to do that without a a large amount of regulation and like none of the governments that are in power in the country's most polluting and most powerful countries right now are interested in doing that. Totally. So. I, I, you know, that kind of uh, dialogue or, or conversation, I uh, I feel like it really decontextualizes the problem. Yeah. Like, oh, if we just, if we just reigned, it's like, no, capitalism is kind of like capitalism plus, you know, your 80s reforms of neoliberalism plus your injection mm-hmm. of fossil fuels is literally how we got here. Yeah. Like you want to tame the beast slightly uh because you think that we're running out of time like right quite frankly or point you know, it quite- like people want to point it at like 
you know, carbon capture and renewables. And, and <laughs> all it becomes this whole like eco modernist techno utopia thing, which I'm like, absolutely. And, but we, and also we know that it doesn't work, right? That, you know, yeah. the UK is a really great example of that, where like billions were given away in contracts to carbon capture. It was like just another Tory crony, you know, whose yeah. company had no history in doing that. Mm-hmm. Like these people are just trying to. I think the people in charge are aware that there is an emergency and are just trying to like flush as much resources and money out of the system while they still can yeah. until it perhaps collapses. Like, I think that might be the situation that we're looking at now. They have I no think so too. That definitely it. seems to be the road that oil companies are committed to. Mm. And then, yeah, I mean, like right now in the, in the US, there's a ton of money going towards carbon capture and direct air capture and like quote unquote blue hydrogen and all of these things. Yeah. And like there's no, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's this whole situation where like even the academic research that a lot of those ideas are based on was paid for by fossil fuel companies to, to justify like, the policy mechanism that then like funnels money back into it, you know? And it's just like, none of this is, I, I'm like, I don't know, like would, I was, um, I was talking to a guy at a university the other day cause he had seen, I had done some reporting on like fossil fuel money in university research and his university takes a lot of money from fossil fuel companies and he was like having some feelings about it so he got me <laughs> on LinkedIn and was like can we talk about this because I'm you know like I want to I want to make sure that we're like being self-critical actually which was good he's like I want to you know my initial reaction was defensiveness but actually like it'd be good to talk about it and hear you know like why you think it's potentially a problem and whatever. So we had this whole conversation and he was like, but the only money we take from fossil fuel companies is, is to fund research into solutions like, you know, carbon capture and hydrogen. And I was like, right, but it's the solutions that the fossil fuel industry is interested in. Right. And he was like, Oh, (laughs) Like, like, I'm like, do we know that these are the best solutions No, because all of the science that's gone into researching solutions has been at least partially funded by an industry that has a vested interest in particular solutions being the ones that we go with, right? So, like, Mm -hmm. we don't even know. There could be some amazing thing out there that, like, you know, hardly anyone's looked into because there's no money in it. Um, it could also be some amazing thing that was invented and patented and then bought by the industry that was then shut down. Yeah. Entirely plausible. Yes. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's talk about how they have so much power. Now, this investigation that you did recently in conjunction with them, or co-published at least with DSmog yeah. into the Atlas Network was just yeah. mind-blowing. And everybody I knew was like hooked on it and talking about That's it for weeks great. on end. Um, yeah, because it's like, I mean, this is what's so great, I think, about so much of your work, you know, like doing Drilled, the podcast in a true crime style. It's like, yeah, we're you're, we're live blogging just sort of the the totally ridiculous, absurd levels of crime and corruption yeah. um, that are facilitating the destruction of, of the planet. Yeah. Um, and it does feel like sometimes you're in a badly written novel uh, in the sense it's of like, how on the nose, you know, you're like, how does this work? I can't even believe this actually is working. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, it's like James Bond come to life, you yeah. know, just these like, ridiculous characters that are so two dimensional in their intentions yeah. and their their motives, um, and yet they get away with it because there's so much power and money kind of um, congealed uh, within within the this elite society. So yeah, please, can you tell us about the Atlas Network, who they are, and what the hell they're up to? Yes. It's so fascinating to me because they are enormous and really powerful and they're like everywhere, but there's been very, very little written about them Um, in part because they don't really particularly want people knowing about or writing about them, or at least that's what it seems like. Um, So the Atlas Network is a network of neoliberal think tanks that was created by a guy named Anthony Fisher and Anthony Fisher was like a a kind of the wealthy son in a mining family who went off to World War II 
um, had a very traumatic experience, of course, as you know, sort of everyone did in World War II. Yeah. Lost his brother. He and his brother were in the same regiment, and you know, he sort of like saw his brother fall to his death. It was like very traumatic, and he also really came out of that being very, very conservative politically and seeing, you know, labor in the UK as being sort of a slippery slope to communism and socialism, which he associated with Nazi Germany. So when he came back from the war and the UK had their first kind of normal election post-World War II and labor won, he was like totally shocked by this. He was just like, Hmm. what? Like how, I don't understand how people are voting for this and this is terrible. And he went off to the US to, you know, speak to some people and do some research. And he came back and he was gung-ho going into politics. He was going to become a Tory politician. And he went and talked to this economist that he really admired named Hayek, Friedrich Hayek. He was an Austrian guy. Friedrich. Yes, Friedrich. <laughs> he, had, um, he, had, <laughs> he had moved from Austria to the UK and was teaching at the London School of Economics at the time. And he'd written um, this really famous book that now I'm going to forget the name of. Let's see. What is it? Hold on, sorry. Because oh, yeah. I love the fact there's like like there's a, a a tiny little like footnote in this story that Anthony Fisher didn't even read the real book. He read the right the Reader's Digest version of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but didn't quite a lot of people did, didn't it? And it yes, I, yeah, I can't remember it either. But the real book, when we get the title, is apparently surprisingly nuanced for for Hayek and the Reader's Digest version was like this you know really sort of cartoonish villainized the road to serfdom that's what it's that's the road to serfdom and he sort of like you know warns about too much reliance on government intervention and talks about um entrepreneurs and you know business people as being sort of the um, the people who really create freedom and democracy. Um, so this is this is sort of a fundamental neoliberal text. It gets cited by like Keynes and Milton Friedman and all all of the, all of the big neoliberal economists that come later. Fisher is like this is this is brilliant. I need to talk to this guy. He goes and finds him at the London School of Economics, and he tells him like I'm going to run for office because I want to get like your ideas should be you know part of how we're governing. And Hayek tells him, like, forget about getting into politics. You need to engage in what he called the war of ideas. And Mm -hmm. you need to go after the um, elite members of society and uh, university professors and start to shape ideas at that level, because that's actually how labor has become popular. It's not because of any particular politician. It's because, you know, there's, there's public support behind particular ideas. So you need to reverse that. So he goes off and he starts a think tank called the Institute for Economic Analysis in the UK, the IEA, which is, we know it well. Yeah, still very <laughs> active today. Um, and for the first few years, like they are just kind of puttering along, you know, like they're working with different um, academic researchers to put out white papers, but like really wonky, you know, it's like picking up particular loopholes in tax policy and stuff like that. It's very, very in the weeds, Um, And then he gets introduced to some people at Shell and BP, and he's able to bring in some money to the IEA from Shell and BP. And that's when things really start to take off. So they start to produce more policy papers on kind of like broader economic forces and broader ideas around, you know, government involvement in different industries and taxes and the energy industry in particular and all of this stuff. Um, and again, like he keeps the IEA very hidden, you know, it's sort of like they contract with a university researcher and then the, the white paper gets published and, uh, they kind of get copies made and they distribute it and stuff, but they don't really attach the IEA to, to it overly much. And they don't talk about their corporate funders at all. So it's all considered to be sort of independent, economists writing about these things. 
And it starts to really gain traction within the UK government. Eventually, Fisher is credited with getting M- Margaret Thatcher elected and really sort of like bringing Thatcherism to the UK in general. Um, and as all of this is going on, like people in other places are watching this going, wow, the like this guy has really managed to turn the UK around in like a decade. How did he do it? So he starts to get invited to Canada, the US, Australia, again, all places where the fossil fuel industry is quite entrenched. You know? <laughs> and, um, and he gets asked to start other think tanks that are sort of copycatting the IEA. So he helps to start the Fraser Institute in Canada. He meets the Kochs very early on in the US, the Koch brothers, Charles and David, who run Coke Industries, which is a big um, oil and gas refining company. They, um, they own quite a bit of the sort of refining and pipeline business in the US, and they're very invested in extractive industry in general. And they are already starting to kind of think about this need to reshape ideas around how the economy works in the U.S. So um, he connects with them, starts a couple think tanks in the U.S. as well, starts one in Australia called the uh, Council for Policy Studies. And again, in Australia, same thing. It's like, you know, the Murdochs are involved, Rio Tinto. Naturally. uh, You know, Mm the good guys. All of the, yeah, it's like all the mining and oil and gas. In Canada, it's the tar sands guys. Um, and in the US, it's Exxon. So they're all there, like right from the beginning. Once he's made a few of these copycat think tanks, he thinks, oh, we should really have a network. It should be a network of think tanks so that they can all work together and influence each other and share ideas across the board. And so that we have sort of a, an easy way to incubate more think tanks. Uh, so that's where the Atlas Network comes from. He creates Atlas Network in 1981. And then they immediately go to Latin America is where like they focus first because at the time Latin America was seen as this huge threat to global neoliberalism because there were so many leftists and communists in Latin America. Right. So really like you Atlas network is very highly responsible for a big swing to the right throughout Latin America in the eighties and nineties. If you like bring it up to today, it was Atlas Network think tanks that got Bolsonaro elected in Brazil as well. So they're very active in that part of the world too. Um, now they've started to branch out quite a bit into Africa. They have almost 600 think tanks globally. And there's there's like the, you know, sort of original think tanks that were created by Fisher himself. Those are all still alive and well. And then um, they opened it up for membership to, you know, like-minded think tanks. So ones that they didn't necessarily have a hand in incubating, but that they, you know, share different values and sort of goals with. So all of the Coke funded think tanks in the U.S. are there. You've got policy exchange in the U.K., um, along with, of course, still the IEA and the Adam Smith Institute, really like any neoliberal think tank. I always look to see if they're on the Atlas Network member list because it's a really high probability that they are. Um, And actually, so after we, so uh, like the whole way that we kind of stumbled upon Atlas Network was that I was looking into the increased criminalization of climate protest. And I was specifically, we, we were working with reporters in uh, Australia and the UK and Europe and Africa and Latin America and India and all these different places. And we were seeing a lot of the same rhetoric showing up in media. So it was like, okay, there seems to be a pattern here where like a conservative pundit goes on to radio and TV and whatever, and talks about climate activists in like one of two ways. They're either like young kids that don't know what they're saying and should be in school so they can learn about economics. Like, you know, they're dumb and silly and whatever, or they're entitled rich kids or a third way they're eco terrorists. And like, this is a slippery slope to anarchy. And these people are really scary and, 
you know, we should be thinking about um, criminalizing them in some way. So that it starts to show up like in every single, you know, place that we're looking at very similar rhetoric. And I'm like, what is that? What's like linking them? Cause there were definitely some things in common with, you know, all the coal countries shared some approaches. So there's definitely some industry, you know, collaboration and coordination going on there. But then I started to look at, okay, who is, who is this spokesperson affiliated with? And in every single case, it was a think tank in that country. It was like, okay, so there's all these, think tanks do they have a relationship and then sure enough it was like oh they're all part of the atlas network that's really interesting and atlas has has kind of bragged for quite some time about how much the think tanks in the network collaborate and share ideas so it's kind of hard for them to be like no we're not you know um (laughs) well done boys yeah 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 the more we started looking at it, the more I was like, oh, wow, like there's a real pattern here where you really see ideas start with one of the think tanks and then sort of like spread really quickly to others. You know, um, even with like we were looking into what's called red washing in Canada where, you know, people will try to partner with an indigenous organization and and basically offer quite a bit of money for them to be uh, sort of a pro fossil fuel spokesperson. And in Canada, that effort was led by the McDonald Laurier Institute, which is another Atlas think tank. And they had put out all these white papers saying indigenous protest is a huge problem for Canada. This is like before even the big pipeline protest started there, there was a, um, an indigenous nationwide protest that was pushing for better treaty rights, you know, more equality for First Nations people in general. And at that point, even McDonald Laurier was like, oh, this is going to be a big problem for extractive industry. Even before there Mm. were like people that were protesting mining and and pipeline stuff, they were like, this is going to be a problem. Here's how we solve it. First step, try to get as many of the First Nations groups as possible to be on your side, you know, bring them into the deal, like make them part of the team. And then once, as soon as you do that, make them your spokespeople so that people can't say that you're against First Nations people. And then they're like, and anybody anybody who doesn't want to get on board, those ones you have to criminalize. They just like lay it out in a white paper. And then they're having all these meetings with, you know, provincial politicians. And pretty soon there are, uh, you know, criminalization laws being passed in Alberta, which is like the the big extractive province in Canada and, you know, being proposed in other places and all this stuff. So at first I was like, oh, you know, I wonder if, I wonder if that's happening anywhere else. And we saw very similar um, suggestions being made in Australia so I thought, okay, maybe McDon- McDonald Laurier is like the origin of this strategy and it's populating elsewhere. But then I found the Institute, what is it called? The Institute for like defense of liberty. <laughs> 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 Always um, oh. in, in Latin America. And they were like, the, the guy who runs that one is a really well-known economist, neoliberal economist. The Clintons were a big fan of his as well. Um, And he had been saying this since like 2008 because there were all of these uh, uprisings where indigenous people were were not wanting um, oil and gas companies to be drilling in their land. And there was a big, uh, a, a big conflict with police at one point. And so this guy like starts to develop this, this whole theory out of this. He's like, oh, the reason that they're protesting is because they're poor. And if they had a, a property title and some kind of like ability to claim some percentage of the revenue from these projects, then they wouldn't be protesting it. And it's so interesting to me because I'm like, oh, wow, it's like this worldview that like cannot comprehend that people might care about something other than money. Um, And in his like he kind of criticizes environmentalists for 
not being able to understand that like some indigenous people want to be part of the the business side and like do want to be you know participating in that but even then it's like it's like well they don't want their land just being taken from them and someone else making a bunch of money off of it while they're still poor yes that's true but does that mean that they think the ideal use of that land is for oil and gas production no like those are two totally different conversations (laughs) yeah um and like Yeah. I don't know. I'm just like, you're still not actually giving them a choice. Like the whole basis of the argument is, oh, well, the reason that indigenous people are protesting is because, you know, they don't have economic freedom. Well, nonsense. You're not actually giving them economic freedom by cutting them into the deal. You're just not exploiting them quite as much, but that's not the same Mm -hmm. as giving people choice or giving people economic freedom. Anyway, so yeah, it was like, wow, like all of these little tactics that we could trace through different Atlas Network think tanks. And I, it really, I was like, wow, this is so interesting. And then I talked to this guy who studies them in Australia and he was like, well, yeah, the... The Atlas Network, because I was kind of still like, why do we, why do these things exist and why are they so powerful when, you know, these companies have access to global PR firms, they have a ton of influence via lobbying and various other things. Like, why do they need the think tanks? Because the think tanks are all kind of, they're kind of clownish, you know, it's like they say really dramatic things and it's like, No one's surprised to hear that, you know, the conservative think tank is like, we don't, we shouldn't have any environmental regulation or whatever it is, you know? And he was like, no, they exist to say like the most extreme viewpoints that the companies don't feel like they can say anymore. So like once the companies stopped pushing climate denial, for example, you see this huge explosion of it in the think tank universe because they kind of are the space to, Mm. I don't know, kind of say the stuff that you wouldn't, like your PR firm wouldn't say it because you wouldn't want it to be connected to the company at all, but the company still want those ideas out there. Yeah. They want to be like fanning the flames of that. They just can't be like officially connected to it. It's it's the Overton window, right? Like, totally. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. As long as somebody somewhere is still saying climate Atlas denialism. Created, by the way. It's a, an Atlas guy. Overton is an Atlas think tank guy. <laughs> no way. Yes. He was That's with the, 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 it's the Mackinac Institute. I can't remember his first name, but yeah, he was the director of policy for an Atlas network think tank. And he's the one that came up with, he's like, oh yeah, like if you just, you know, <laughs> introduce like these extreme ideas then you shift what people think of as being moderate and central good god i think Mm -hmm. to me the thing that stands out so much in what you're talking about is like this exactly you said the the illusion of choice and the illusion that the economic Mm -hmm. system works in any other way because when you're talking about this this counter argument this neoliberal argument being like well if they had property rights if they could make money from this land they would want in you just mm-hmm. have to look at loads of countries in Southeast Asia or Papua New Guinea, for example. 90% of that land is still owned by the tribes. They have the rights to it. They have the deeds. And yet, are those deeds respected? Typically, no. And exactly. The, the logging industry has a whole playbook. You know, you know what you you know you get a tribe's land, you bribe one of them. You bribe one of you find the one that can be bribed. If they can, you bribe them with yeah. a, you know a healthy sum of money for him. Um, yeah. And you get them to sign, uh, you get a contract drawn up, which typically this person cannot read because it'll be drawn up in a different language. And what yeah. they're doing is signing the consensus rights over to that one person. And then that one person signs it. And then all of a sudden you have access to the land. And if they don't get that, typically what they will do is just go in and bulldoze anyway and kill the environmental right. defender standing in their way because they're in yeah. bed with the government because the government gets a yeah. huge source of revenue from these industries as well. So like this whole, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing, you know, it's just this illusion of like, oh no, you know we're not like, like you know neoliberalism and capitalism offers everybody like opportunity no 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 no. we are yeah. you are t- building wealth off of destruction that's what this yeah. economic system was built to do and yeah. suggesting essentially economics to me is just like it's just um magic fairy tales that are like morally bankrupt it, mm-hmm. it's totally a religion okay. again so much of like early economic theory was funded like 
theory and research in universities was funded by fossil fuel companies. Like the, to me, that's actually the more, more interesting than even the funding of like climate science or climate solutions or whatever is the funding of economics and public policy schools, which they have been doing since like the thirties, forties. Um, wow. You know, like a lot of the economic models that get, that get used to say, Oh, it's too expensive to act on climate or yeah. whatever are models that were commissioned by the American Petroleum Institute. You know, it's, it goes like, it's so, um, and there again, it's like people act like economics is, you know, objective, objective <laughs> truth or something, you know, and it's like, it, it's all built on assumptions that people have for all kinds of reasons, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and like, models that you know someone is deciding what the inputs of those models are um and again they could be making those decisions from any number of places you know so it's like yeah i don't know it's I don't know. like i i didn't i hadn't quite put that together that they were funding economic theory fossil fuel industry although it makes sense yeah. i think this um this other sort of like master illusion that a social science, which yeah. should, is a social science, sort of sits under the the sciences camp and gets to mock and oh, ridicule totally. the other. So, the other like math science. and tech yeah. somehow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Equations. No, 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 no. <laughs> you were equating your like desires essentially with some fundamental yeah. human driver of like how hu- yeah. humans organize. Some, a universal yeah. or driver and how humans organize um, or how society yeah. should be organized. And yeah. it is deeply, deeply, deeply dangerous. And I think it kind of speaks to the this really interesting time that we find ourselves in where our, like our language is as disengaged from reality as our economic system is from our bio, from our biome, essentially. Like yeah. costs to yeah. the environment are externalities that aren't counted in, you know, the idea right. that you can like account for carbon. It's... It is, we've fallen down their rabbit hole into a very, very dangerous, um, a very dangerous time where people think it is easier to reform the thing causing the problem than just change the thing, you know? Yes, <laughs> yes, totally. And and there's such belief in it. Like, so after that story came out, there was a woman who runs one of the Atlas Network think tanks. Um, it's called the Center for African Prosperity. And her name oh. is Magali. And um, yeah, and she, she like, she got really mad about this story and she um, kind of was going off on Twitter and she, she made all these graphics that were like, like fight posters with like her versus me challenging me to a debate and like all of this stuff. It sounds really like over the top, but I was like, you know, um, actually I, I sent an interview request for you because I wanted to talk to you for the story and I'd be happy to talk to you now. If, if you need to frame it as a debate, that's fine. But like, mm. I'm actually interested in talking to you. And mm. she was like, Oh, okay. And <laughs> So then we set up this conversation and she came in like really hot at first and was like, really, you know, like, um, but I kind of, I was telling someone the other day, I'm like, I have a very difficult mother. So I'm like, pretty good at staying calm and like tense conversations. You know? I do know. I know exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Like someone was asking me the other, like, what do you think made you a journalist? This, that, the other. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe it was my mom being so, <laughs> such a difficult person. Um, but anyway, like I... <laughs> So I'm like, I'm pretty good at, at like not taking the bait, you know, I'm like, mm. I know what you're trying. I know the reaction that you're trying to get. And I'm, I'm like going to calmly not give it mm. to you. And so, uh, you know, after a little bit, it, she sort of was like a little more open to actually talking about things, you know? And I was like, and, and I'm like, you know, like she really struck me as someone who genuinely believes that mm. like, if you can just make it easier for more people to start businesses, that that is the fix for poverty. But I was like, yeah, but that assumes a market that's not rigged. Like the, the one, like you're assuming that the only thing affecting that is government bureaucracy and obstacles. Right. 
But like that completely removes the role that all of these corporations who benefit from the government being that way <laughs> like, mm-hmm. are doing, you know, like, so we were talking about oil and gas in Africa. Cause she's like, she was sort of saying, Oh, climate people just want Africa to not develop any fossil fuels at all. And like, just from one day to the next, cut off fossil fuels. And I was like, well, I don't actually know anyone in the climate space that's arguing for that. So it's sort of a straw man that you're setting up here. You know, like, I don't actually know anyone that's like, for, to you know, tomorrow, we're going to shut everything off and everyone can fend for themselves. No mm. one's arguing for that. Um, but I was like, also, this idea that that fossil fuels are the fix for poverty in Africa, or even just for energy poverty in Africa, is is like it's kind of hard to believe because the fossil fuel industry has been there for a really long time and if you look at just nigeria nigeria largest fossil fuel industry on the continent longest running it's been there since the 50s worst energy access rates in the world oh wow if if having the fossil fuel industry in your country was was the thing needed to solve energy poverty then I think that would have been solved in Nigeria by now. Yeah. You know? Yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, let's let's have a look at Iraq as well. You know, post invasion gets opened up to the free market. The West is like, finally, this is what the Middle East needs. This is for you. Yeah. 25% of Iraqis still living in poverty today uh, and fuel poverty, even though it is being exploited by Western companies. Like I, I think they're now producing 4.5. A million barrels of oil a day from like one of the oil fields. Totally. It doesn't go to the people. We know that. And there's like, you know, outrageously high cancer rates in (laughs) all the communities that are near those areas. And the, the doctors in those areas have been told by the government that they are not allowed to write down that anyone's health problems are related to what's happening at the refineries. Good Lord. Because they're that you know, in bed with, with the private oil companies, which are exporting all of that wealth, you know, like, Mm -hmm. that's the other thing I'm like, well, these are massive, these are most of the projects in Africa are not for Africa, although eventually they will be because the just like cigarettes and combustion vehicles before them, definitely the fossil fuel companies are like, oh, well, when the global north countries shift away from us, we still have Africa to sell to. Don't worry, guys. Mm. Um, You know, (laughs) yeah. I asked her that, too. I was like, you know, well, I've talked to people in the global south who are from these countries in Africa or in South America, where the, the industry is really focused right now, who say, we don't want this. We don't, we actually would rather go straight to the next energy thing and not be told, Hey, you guys are going to be stuck on fossil fuels for another 20 years while we, you know, transition to a different type of energy, you know? And and like, what do you say about that? And in Africa, especially I'm like, if, if what you're actually looking for is energy independence and sovereignty then the best choice in Africa would actually be renewables. Um, if you can sort out and, you know, I'm like, look, I'm, I'm also very realistic about the problems around scale and distribution and transmission and all of that is very real needs to be built currently like impossible for a lot of global South countries to do because of how development financing mm-hmm. works. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, that didn't just happen. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't governments that set it up that way. It was mostly corporate influence that like pointed development funding towards being working really well for fossil fuel projects and not so much for, you know, solar, wind, whatever else. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I felt, I was like, well, maybe, I don't know if anything that like we talked about, Uh, shifted her thinking at all but it was interesting to hear some of the like belief system that was was coming through and this like real belief in the idea that like markets are the solution to you know all of these things as though markets exist independent of 
corporate influence, mm-hmm. corruption, like all of these other things. I think um, it just goes yeah. to show how the only thing that really trickles down is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true yes <laughs> it's yeah. it's amazing how these corporate interests and this energy this energy industry have essentially tried to embed themselves in like the mental image that we have of the world yes. to say like you know if we if we stop using fossil fuels everything crashes um, right. Or like markets, markets exist uh, because, you know, you unleash the capacity of corporations to provide. It's like markets have been in existence long before polit- like politics has really, or, you know, yeah. government, the nation state, democracy, you know, we've, there's totally. always been yeah. markets. Um, yeah. They exist between people. And yes, the moment that you give corporations the legal right to exist as a person, then they can start operating in the world as uh, between them in the way that they are and creating these kinds totally. of like networks. But but yeah. like up until that point, so human society was still meant to be organized around like people fulfilling things for one another as a community. And we will manage to do that no matter what our energy supply is, no matter what yeah. our regulations are. The point is mm-hmm. that we are deliberately existing in an economy that has been built to try and like damage those relationships as much as possible so that we depend on the corporate yeah. world to provide. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, in, in the U S right now, I would say corporations have more rights than people mm. at this point. I think, Definitely. I think we've like fully jumped that bridge. You know? have, you, and, have you seen the work yeah. of um, the, the team at Declassified that have looked into ICSID mm. This investor no. state. Oh, you're gonna love this. Um, oh, investor state dispute system. Yes. 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 I actually asked this Atlas Network lady about it because I was like, Go okay, ahead. what do you think about this? Because this seems like it would be very anti democracy. You know, like you're supposedly pro everyone. You know, having rights and sovereignty and all this stuff. Like this, I actually, to me, this is like the biggest looming issue for any kind of climate action and I like you're starting to see more people talking about it but like I haven't seen anyone propose a solution to it you know it's like people countries can get out of these treaties but even when they do that you're still beholden to the uh, to the arbitration clause for like ten years, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then also you might suffer in that the world because it's a, an arm of like you know the World Bank. Maybe they just won't give you funding for something else, or right, you know, right. yeah, or just the threat of it. Like you know, these it costs yeah millions of dollars to deal with a, an arbitration claim or an investor mm-hmm. state dispute claim. Even if you win, you still have to spend all of that time and money dealing with it, Mm -hmm. you know, so just the threat of it. And then, you know, they find in favor of the corporation, I think it's like 70, 80 percent of the time. It's very, very heavily weighted towards the corporations. (laughs) So if like governments look at that, you know, and they're just and they're trying to like weigh the liabilities, it's sort of like, well, it's not worth, you know, taking the risk. In a lot of cases, of course. Um, but this is but so, this is yeah. the thing. What do we what do we do? You know, when when you've got this that exists yeah. to ensure that governments can sue nations, um, if, for example, you know, the we swing to the left and you get a kind of eco uh, political right. group in, and they want to make changes and they want to enact some climate policy, um, yeah. which is their sovereign right, then they can get sued by corporations that are going to lose access to profits that they were previously, you know, forecasted. You've got that, right. you've got this Atlas network that is, you know, 600 plus lobbyist think tanks that are embedded in governments around the world that are doing this incredibly yeah. coordinated attack on civil society and on politics yeah. itself. And to combat this, you know, you've got essentially like a decent, fairly decentralized activist networks um, around yeah. the world. You've got some think tanks, some some lobby, some good uh, politicians, whatever. But like, how can we go up against this this very well oiled machine that keeps that keeps it yeah. going? I think this is this is when I think about the next ten years and the kind of thing that needs to be done. Like, yeah, I mean, say we were to. I don't know, in the UK, um, say the Greens got in, revoked all of the the new licenses for oil and gas and started shutting down the fossil fuel industry. They'd immediately get sued. 
That's what happened in the the U.S. Biden finally canceled Keystone. The company that owns the Keystone Pipeline has filed a $10 billion claim against the U.S. And like, if you're the U.S., $10 billion is not great, but you can deal with it. If you're Mozambique, you're fucked. Yeah. And they have like 30 different, you know ways that that could possibly happen in Mozambique yeah. right now. So like you talk to activists there and they're like, well, our government is too scared. Even if our government was like in favor of doing this, which at this point they're so captured by, you know, Total and whoever else that they're not. But even if they were, then the next thing would be that they're so worried about how much it would cost them to cancel the permits for, you know, this, that, and the other, or to just, pass a law that requires that say companies, you know, disclose the emissions related to their, yeah. know, that kind of stuff. It's like even that they could um they could be subject to a complaint and it could be a complaint that bankrupts the country. Yep. You know, yeah. It's, it's madness. It, it's it, total madness. That's the place where I feel like, you know, there's increasingly, I think, more social scientists are sort of like, it's going to take like revolution. It's going to take like, well, you know, yeah. millions of people being like, fuck this. We're just, yeah. oh, we're getting rid of this system. I don't care what your fucking treaty says. It's gone. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <You know>? Totally. <laughs> like, because you're dealing with companies that are more powerful than any one government. This is like the, the um, have you read the book Private Empire by Steve Call? I haven't. I feel like it's, it's such a good title because it's, that's what these companies are. They're all little empires, you know, that have, they're they, like ExxonMobil, for example, has a huge amount of power in the US, Canada, Australia, the UK. Like, it's like, yeah. they don't just have lobbyists in their home country. They're, they're yeah. like controlling policy in multiple countries at the same time. And then they have this whole weird, like pseudo legal system where they can sue companies for, um, for lost profits. And those, I mean, those arguments get heard before a secret tribunal of, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. Like again, like, so it's like, this yeah. would not work for a movie script. But this is really it can't. It's a secret tribunal of the three judges who are not actually judges. They're just no. corporate lawyers. No. One of them is oh, they don't even they don't, the company. they don't even have to be lawyers. They don't have to be trained legally. Yeah, that's right. They just have to like kind of be aware of the arbitration mm-hmm. system. One of them is selected by the company yeah. for fairness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. like... This is outrageous. In Ecuador, you know, Chevron lost a case, very famous case there, right? It was like Texaco spilled all this oil in the Amazon. Chevron inherited this lawsuit when they acquired Texaco. They all argued to get it moved to Ecuador because at the time, Texon and the, Texaco and then Chevron had quite a bit of control over the government and the legal system in Ecuador, then the government changed and they lost that control. And all of a sudden they were not so happy about having to go through the courts in Ecuador. They lost the case. It got, they appealed up, you know, it went all the way to the Supreme court in Ecuador and they said, no, this we're we're upholding this judgment. You owe the plaintiffs this much money. Before that even happened, they had already filed a RICO suit against the attorneys in the U S accusing them of, you know, bribing judges and basically oh, like competing against them, which of course, <laughs> like I'm, I'm sure both sides were trying to bribe everybody, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> and, mm-hmm. Um, I actually like one of the witnesses admitted at one point that Chevron had paid him, but like that didn't seem to matter <laughs> at the same time they filed a, um, an investor state dispute. So mm. Ultimately, even though they still have this judgment against them, they um, it can't be collected in the U.S. because of the racketeering charge against the lawyers there. So, you know, they've got the U.S. is out. That's great. Then they won their investor state dispute claim against Ecuador. So right today, the government of Ecuador owes Chevron two billion dollars for allowing its courts to rule against Chevron Um, or like 
you know, allowing corruption in its courts that ended up, you know, costing Chevron all of this money. Oh, and you what- couldn't make it up. You could not reach it. Right. They haven't played it yet. And a lot, there's a whole thing, like a lot of activists are trying to lean on them to not to like refuse to pay it and, you know, whatever. But it's wild. Mm-hmm. It's totally wild mm-hmm. that like, and it's completely robbing countries of their sovereignty mm-hmm. entirely, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the only entities that have sovereignty are, are corporations now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Even more so than individuals. Like I think, yeah, they do. They have, they have sovereignty and, um, and really in a way that no one else does. Yeah. And so, I mean, facing down the barrel of the 2020s, looking at 2030 now as kind of, I think, I don't know about you, but I feel like we all have this as like the internal deadline. Um, yeah, even though like the entire fossil fuel industry has just changed it to 2050 yeah, somehow. Like, yeah, yeah. And even though we're technically like accelerating so fast in terms of emissions and everything, it's not 20 and yeah. plus El Nino. Like it's it's bloody arbitrary now. But nonetheless, yeah. like we've got this sort of countdown. Nations don't have the sovereignty to do what's needed to enact climate policies um, mm-hmm. and also to collaborate together and network together in order to like take on this massive corporate interest that is embedded into like you know these the most powerful political institutions in the world like the united states which is just a massive corporation if you look at how much money is in their politics as well yes yeah so i guess um what do we (laughs) what do we do what do we do what do we do Mm. uh i mean it's funny because i feel like well you know when no one entity has the power or the sovereignty to take this on. You have to like, you have to come together, right? Like this is where I'm like, okay, well, you know, could, I mean, it would take politicians with an actual backbone for countries to come together and like, and be like, nope, we're actually not going to do this anymore. Um, And the only way that they would do that is if they had so many of their citizens out in the street every day, that they couldn't possibly do otherwise, or if they got completely overthrown, which like, you know, I don't know. It's, I think that like people, um, I know Americans at least like really have this idea that sort of, Oh, it would never happen in the U S that like, you know, we couldn't have elections working anymore or things like that. You've got pretty close. (laughs) happen you know and like you know or people even think about things that happened like in their parents lifetime and can't imagine it happening today but I'm like yeah I mean you know we had like a long period of of stability in a lot of places and like that those days are over and like there are lots of different things that could happen um and I mean historically one thing that tends to happen when citizens feel like their governments are not working on their behalf and like corporations and governments have gotten out of control with power and are not working towards the common good is that people get to a point where they're just not having it anymore. Um, And I kind of think that's what it's going to take because all, all of these systems are so entrenched that the idea of using the existing systems to deal with this problem. I just don't know how that could happen. Like, I don't know how I'm like the judiciary, eh, you know, kind of like there's some lawsuits that are, that are causing some, some trouble for folks. But at a certain point you run up against judges that are in the pocket of of corporations too, or you run up against politicians that don't, that, that decide that they're going to help the corporations around what the judiciary has decided, you know? Um, so I don't know. I'm like, if there's, there's so much corporate capture, then I think the only thing that's ever actually worked against it is sounds so hippie. I am from California. I can't help it. (laughs) People power. Like you just, it's like, that's the only thing that's ever worked. Um, yeah. Is, you know, as individuals, we don't have a lot of power, but 
as a collective, especially if it's, you know, quite a large collective, then, and this is, again, brings us back to what we were talking about at the beginning. This is why it's so important for climate people to understand that they're part of the struggle for democracy and the struggle for civil rights. And the, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. if you think that you're going to get millions of people out in the streets for batteries, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, sir, but you're wrong. <laughs> oh, Amy, you know, I think I think that's for I let's <laughs> given you can, it's been a dark episode. I think we should end on a laugh. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very, very much. That was excellent. <laughs> yeah, thank my, you. My final question for you is: Who would you like to platform? I would say Mary Anais Hegler. I don't know if you've had yeah. her on before. No, I haven't. She's, she's my work wife and she's amazing. And like, I always, I always come away from conversations with her thinking about things slightly differently. So like, she's always really good for a, like a perspective shift. Amazing. And she's funny. She's like someone that can laugh about climate change in a way that's quite <laughs> nice. <laughs> I mean, if you can't laugh. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Amy, thank you so much for your time today. This was lovely. Thank you. Thanks for having me. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together. 